Fools and Aging, an introduction. I'm going to tell you about a lady I saw recently, Pearl. Pearl was in her eighties, lived alone, didn't have any carers, and got out of the house to the small supermarket just around the corner, where she bought what she needed and took a taxi the few hundred metres back home. Pearl was generally pretty healthy, hadn't seen her GP for ages, and as far as anyone knew, the only health problems she had were high blood pressure and diabetes, both managed with tablets. I saw Pearl a few months after she'd had a fall. The first thing you do in a falls clinic is, unsurprisingly, find out about this fall. And so, she told me. It has been a normal day. She'd had her lunch, sat down in front of the TV, which I imagine was turned up to the max given how loud I had to shout at her, had a little snooze and woke up needing a toilet. She'd got up, caught her foot on the carpet and fallen over. And that's where she'd been found by her daughter an hour later. She was taken to hospital, checked out, sent home, and referred to us. Now that all sounds very simple, a very normal fall. But it isn't. Have you ever caught your foot on a smooth carpet and fallen over? No, and neither have I. So I talked to her further. It turns out that when she stands up, she often feels dizzy, as her blood pressure drops because of the medication she's on, and a generally reduced vascular response in the elderly. She wears bifocals, as... Like almost all old people, she can't focus on near objects anymore. And that these mean she can't see her feet. She also has slightly reduced sensation in her feet and less awareness of where they are. This occurs naturally to some extent with ageing, but in her case, it was more than might be expected, a complication of years of diabetes. So now we have a story of a lady standing up, feeling slightly dizzy, not being able to see her feet very well, not having perfect feeling in them, and so she stumbles. Think for a second about what happens if you stumble. You put the other leg forward and catch yourself. But what happens to the elderly when they stumble? Their reflexes are that bit slower. Full stop. No cause, no diagnosis, just normal ageing. So they respond later. They've fallen that degree or two further forward than you or I. But they still respond. They still put that other leg out. But being that degree or two further over, the forces involved are that little bit more. And so they need that little bit of a push to get them back upright. And what else don't they have? Muscle strength. And that's normal ageing too. Think of what happens to an athlete's muscles with training. They get stronger. Now think of what happens if the only activity you have is walking 200 yards to the shops. So they respond slower, have less muscle strength to get them back up. And so what started as a simple trip ends up with them on the floor. A surprisingly hard place to get up from. And what happens to the elderly when they fall? They break things. Bones naturally reach peak strength in your 20s and it's downhill from there, especially in women once they've gone through the menopause. Thankfully Pearl was lucky, she didn't break anything. So there you have the real story of Pearl's fall. She stood up to go to the toilet, felt lightheaded, couldn't see her feet, caught them on something overbalanced, responded slower than she would have done a few years ago, didn't have the muscle strength to respond, and ended up on the floor, where she thankfully didn't break anything. I'm going to come back to Pearl's story later, but I'll give you another story of a fall, my own. I'd got up, far too early at 6am to go to work, was still sleepy, turned the sharp corner at the top of my stairs, stepped a few centimetres too far forward on one of the steps, my stock sock slipped, I fell. I reached out, caught the banister, fell five steps down, my grip held and I stopped. I strained something in my shoulder, and that's it. That's what happens when young people fall. Short, simple, dull stories. But even then there were consequences. Whatever I'd done to my shoulder meant I couldn't ride my mountain bike for a week or two. And, regardless of whether or not I'm any good at it, biking's important to me. Just think for a second of what's important to you. Possibly pause this video and write something down. Okay. Obviously, I can't go through your lists, but I'm going to give a few examples of mine and my family's. Hopefully, some will tie in with what you've just thought of. Cycling, running, seeing family, going on holiday to Mallorca. That's from my mum. Socialising and talking to people. That's from my wife. 
So what happens to these things with ageing? Cycling. Road biking isn't bad, actually. It's an endurance sport, and we stay good at endurance sports unless we develop heart or lung conditions well into advanced ages. Mountain biking's less good. It's explosive at times, going uphill over rocks, and relies on quick reflexes on the descents. Running. That's just awful. Joints don't take it. But before that, when we're much younger, in our late twenties, we lose power. As athletes age, they lose their sprint finish, and so move to longer distances. Look at Mo Farah moving up from running five kilometres to marathons. You can do that a decade longer. Just look at the great Haile Gabri Selassie, setting a marathon world record, age 35. The same pattern continues into later ages. Seeing family. My family's all over the country. Essex, Eastbourne, London, Bath. And that's just parents and sisters. How do we see each other? Transport. But that gets harder with age. It's physically more difficult. You may no longer have a driving licence. You may need to stop every few minutes to find a toilet. It's not impossible with age, by any means. Just harder. And going on holiday to the sun? Well... That goes even before travelling to see family. What about socialising and talking to people? We're naturally sociable, and we don't lose that with age. But how do we social socialise, and where? I do it at work, down the pub, in cafes, in restaurants, while cycling. When am I going to lose this? Now, obviously, work goes with age. And as we've seen with the limitation in activities... One day, I'll lose mountain biking too. That's not to say they can't be replaced with other things, but that's part of the problem, that they need to be replaced. Finding new activities and social circles is something we expect to do at younger ages. We go to university, we move to new cities for work. I'm not sure it's something we expect to do later in life. I certainly see huge reluctance in patients to do new activities to replace those they've lost. And what about the less demanding forms of socialisation? Cafes, restaurants, lunch clubs. If you're 80, half the friends of your youth will have died. Or worse, if you're from lower social classes. Of the remainder, one third will have Alzheimer's. It's a strange age to be. It's entirely possible, indeed not unusual, to be healthy, active and sociable. But there's a lot of things against it. Just pause the video here and think for a minute about what might happen with ageing to things on the list you created earlier. Quite often, I see people when the list of what they can't do has built up and up. Quite often, and I think, quite sadly, they haven't replaced it with a list of what they can do. But suddenly, that list isn't just something in their head. That list is in relatives' head. I see, week in, week out, relatives wanting their mother or father safe. Always safe. They want someone checking up on them. They want them wrapped in cotton wool, protected, preserved. They think this will happen with carers, with people providing meals so they don't have to leave the house, with care homes. They say, quite often in front of me, it'll be better for you. You won't have to worry. You'll be safe. You'll live longer. I wonder, do they mean it'll be better for me, I won't have to worry. You'll be safe. Some people accept this. Some elderly people are scared. Indeed, many elderly people are scared, especially of falling. Imagine being on the floor and not being able to get up, not being able to call for help, hoping someone finds you. But many don't accept it. They've been private all their life. They're not having someone intruding in their house. They've known the man in the corner shop for 40 years. The short shops, always ten minutes longer as they stop to talk to someone. They don't like strangers, they're embarrassed of their deteriorating bodies. A multitude of reasons. There's clear conflict between parent and child. There's clear role reversal, and nobody's comfortable with it. This was where Pearl was with her daughter. I'd stopped her blood pressure tablets, accepting with her that the risks of stroke and heart attack were outweighed by not falling and remaining independent. I'd referred her to the physiotherapists, occupational therapists and optometrists, but her daughter was scared. Pearl didn't want carers, didn't want meals on wheels, didn't want to be checked up on. 
And you know what? They didn't really need any of this either. So how did I deal with this? Communication, listening, in front of their relatives to what they're scared of and what we can do about it. Often just hearing this conversation is enough. Often we compromise. Very often we compromise. Pearl went home with just a safety alarm around her wrist so she could alert people if she fell again.